Thanks for joining the Christian Perspective channel. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and turn on the notifications bell so you don't miss a thing. David then expanded his kingdom. He subdued the Philistines, the Syrians, Moab, Edom, Ammon, and others. David then sinned against Uriah the Hittite. He saw Uriah's wife Bathsheba and desired her. He sent a letter to Joab to put Uriah in the front of the battle so he would die. He then took Bathsheba as his own wife. Nathan the prophet then visited him and pronounced judgment upon him. The child Bathsheba bore to David died. And also David was to be humiliated before all of Israel from one in his own household because of what David did to God. Bathsheba then bore David a second son, and he, he was named Solomon. David had other wives and sons and daughters also. David's son Amnon raped his other son's sister. Her name was Tamar and the other son was named Absalom. Absalom then killed Ammon, his half-brother, and fled to another village. Years later, he was returned to Jerusalem and reconciled with his father David. Absalom then stood in the gate of Jerusalem, and anyone who came to see the king for judgment, Absalom would tell them that there is no man to judge, but if I were king, I would be on your side. In this way, he stole the hearts of the people away from David. And after doing this for 40 years, Absalom sent messengers all over Israel proclaiming that Absalom was crowned king in Hebron while he went to Hebron. Then David heard of the plot. He left Jerusalem before Absalom would show up for civil war, and he left his ten concubines behind to take care of the palace. Absalom entered Jerusalem peaceably, and he took over. David escaped over the Jordan River into the land of Ammon, while Absalom pursued him and camped in Gilead. The Ammonites fed David and his army and helped him gain strength. David then sent Joab and his two, and his two generals with thousands of troops to quell the uprising in Israel. He charged them in front of all the people not to harm Absalom his son. Then they had counseled David to stay and wait while they went to battle because he was worth too much to lose. The battle took place in the woods of Ephraim between the people of Israel and David's army. David's generals slew 20,000 people in the woods and they were scattered all through Israel. Absalom was escaping on a mule when it went under a tree, and his hair got caught in the tree, and the mule kept going. Joab and his guards slew Absalom and threw him into a pit and buried him with stones. When David received the message that the revolt was ended and Absalom was dead, he went into his chamber and wept and mourned for Absalom, his son. When Joab arrived at the city, all of the people were ashamed and hanging their heads, because David the king was in mourning for his son. Joab told David he was foolish and in danger of judgment, because he put his enemies above his people. He mourned over Absalom, even though the civil war had ended, and he was in danger of losing Israel again. So David rose up and proclaimed victory and returned to Jerusalem. When he crossed the Jordan, all the people of Judah came to meet him and accompany him back to the city. The rest of Israel became jealous of Judah and said, We have ten times as much interest in the king as you do. Why do you act as if he is your king only? Then a man from Ephraim named Sheba started a second rebellion. He blew the trumpet and said, We have no part in David, O Israel. And all of Israel followed after Sheba, but Judah followed after David. David then sent his mighty men to pursue after Sheba and kill him, 
Sheba ran and hid in a city named Abel of Bekmaka, which is in Naphtali up near Dan. Joab besieged the city, and he was attacking the wall to throw it down. A wise woman called out to Joab, Why are you destroying Israel? Joab replied, I am not here to destroy Israel. Deliver Sheba, who has lifted up his hand against King David, and I will depart from the city. So they threw Sheba's head over the wall, and Joab returned to Jerusalem. David died, and Solomon became king. During David's life, he had gathered all of the materials needed to build a great temple to Yahweh. But it was told him that his son would build God a house. So David never began construction, but he did have all of the materials and the plans drawn up for it. Solomon built the first temple in Jerusalem. Historians call this the beginning of the first temple period. It actually begins at the crowning of King Saul, which leads to David and Solomon. The end of the period of the judges begins the first temple period, in very generalized terms. Samuel was the last judge and Saul was the first king. After Solomon built the temple, he was visited by the queen of Sheba. And then when Solomon was older, he had married many women as alliances with the kingdoms around him. And now we'll, uh, I'll read a, um, a short part of the Bible that describes Solomon's marrying of strange women. Uh, this led to his downfall. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1 to 5. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord had said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love, and he had seven hundred wives princesses, and three hundred concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians. We already learned about Ashtaroth or Astarte, or Ishtar, who is evolved from the Sumerian goddess Inanna, who are all variations of the Queen of Heaven. And after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Milcom is another word for Molech. Not much is known about this one, other than it was a bronze image structure, which was heated by fire, and live child sacrifices were thrown into it. Okay, in verse 6 of the same chapter, And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Shemosh. Remember the other, the other child sacrifice thing. The abomination of Moab. In the hill that is before Jerusalem. And for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. Shemosh seems to be an Ammonite rendition of the Moabite Molech. And starting in verse 8. And likewise he did for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. And he had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he kept not that which his Lord commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my commandment and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, 
I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding, in your days I will not do it for David your father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of your son. Howbeit, I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to your son for David my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. So God raised up adversaries to Solomon. The one Hadad, the Edomite, we spoke about in episode 15, part 1. The other was a man named Jeroboam. We read about him in 1 Kings chapter 11. Jeroboam was an Ephraimite and a mighty man of valor. Solomon made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. The house of Joseph is Manasseh, the older, and Ephraim, the younger. But it extends out to represent ten of the twelve tribes. During the period of Judges, the Ark of the Covenant rested in Shiloh, which is on Mount Ephraim. Saul lost the ark to the Philistines, and it then rested in another place in Ephraim, Gibeah, where the seat of Saul's kingdom was. It was then brought by David to Jerusalem, and then put into Solomon's temple at Jerusalem. The ten tribes, however, had always worshipped at Shiloh during the time of Judges, and they asked for a king, but never really adapted the practice of switching from Ephraim to Jerusalem. This is how the ten tribes were associated with Ephraim, while the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin were associated to David and to Jerusalem. God had moved and made changes through David. He had prophesied the eternal kingdom through the line of David, but the ten tribes were not able to move forward from what God had previously ordained. Many churches have this problem. We must all personally move forward in our faith as we learn more truth. So Jeroboam was made chief over the house of Joseph by Solomon. And he was leaving Jerusalem on his way to Ephraim, and a prophet named Ahijah met him on the road. He had a new coat, and he took it off and ripped it into twelve pieces. He gave Jeroboam ten pieces, and he said, This says Yahweh, God of Israel, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give ten tribes to you. But he shall have one tribe for David's sake and for Jerusalem's sake. I will not take it from Solomon for David's sake, but I will take it from his son, because they have forsaken me and worshipped the gods of other nations. Solomon sought to kill Jeroboam, and Jeroboam fled into Egypt. After Solomon died, his son Rehoboam was made king. When Solomon died, the people of Israel called his son Rehoboam to Shechem to be proclaimed king. They also called Jeroboam back from Egypt. They told Rehoboam, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now, if you make our yoke lighter, we will serve you. He told them to come back in three days, and he will answer them. He asked his father's counselors, who were old and wise, and he also asked his own counselors, whom he grew up with and were young like him. The older ones said, Make their yoke lighter, and they will serve you gladly. But the younger ones said, Make it heavier, and rule over them forcefully. After three days he told them, I will make your yoke heavier than my father did. The people then rejected him, and all went home. When Rehoboam sent the tax collector to collect tribute, they stoned him to death and set up Jeroboam as king of Israel. So now we have Jeroboam as king over Israel, and Rehoboam as king over Judah and Benjamin. Rehoboam assembled an army to go fight against Israel, but God sent a prophet to command him not to, so he didn't go to war. 
Jeroboam built his fortress in Shechem, and he thought that if people were go to Jerusalem to worship at the temple every year, they would eventually start following the king in Jerusalem. So he set up two golden calves, one in Bethel and one in Dan, Dan the city up in the north in Naphtali. He said to Israel, Behold your gods who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. He also set up a priesthood out of the common people, which was also against the laws of Yahweh. God sent a prophet to Bethel to warn them, and Jeroboam was there by the altar. The prophet said, O altar, a child shall be born to the house of David named Josiah, and he shall offer upon thee the priests that burn incense upon thee. And Jeroboam put out his hand to say, Stop this man. But his hand withered, and the altar split in two, and the ashes were poured out, just as the prophet had said. Jeroboam yet continued in his evil and did not stop. Jeroboam's son then became sick. So Jeroboam sent his wife to see the prophet in Shiloh, but he told her to disguise herself and say she was somebody else, that she would get a good prophecy and not a bad one. But the prophet already knew who she was, and God already told him what to say. He said the child would die, and all of Israel would be scattered and rooted up out of their land because of the sins of Jeroboam. He will also scatter Israel beyond the river, because they have made groves to the idols, and he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam. Okay, now, before we move on with the story, we see here how Solomon's son ended up splitting the kingdom, or the kingdom was split under Solomon's son between the kingdom of Judah to the south and the kingdom of Israel to the north. Now Israel was also known as Ephraim because Ephraim was the chief tribe of that part of Israel. And Shiloh was considered the temple of the north while Jerusalem was the temple of the south. But Jeroboam now He set his kingdom up in Shechem, his palace, and he set up a temple with a golden calf in Bethel, and he set up another temple with a golden calf in Dan in order to create a new religion to keep the people of Israel in his kingdom and not in the other kingdom. This brought upon them the anger of God. Now, I have collected a few scriptures here uh, that we will go through here before we move on uh, because prophecy and scripture is starting to come into this uh, a little more deeply and uh, we're starting to get into some depth here about Ephraim. Ephraim becomes a very key figure in prophecy. It's very important to understand who Ephraim is and usually more importantly who it isn't. Let's we'll take a look first at the Psalms of David to see how Ephraim and and Judah were regarded as prominent tribes. This prominence of these two tribes came from the time when Jacob or Israel blessed his 12 sons before he died. We're going to focus on Judah and Joseph in these prophetic blessings. We don't need to analyze them, but we want to see how the Israelites regarded these tribes because of the earlier prophetic words of Jacob and Moses. Yes, Moses also blessed the 12 tribes before his death. And the blessings of Moses are very similar to the blessings of Jacob. Let's take a quick look at them both. Genesis chapter 49, verse 8. 
We're just going to look at Judah and Joseph. Joseph is Ephraim and Manasseh. Of Judah, Jacob said, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thy enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion, as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his foal unto the vine, and the ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. So that's what Jacob said about Judah. Um, there's a lot of messianic prophecy there, and Judah is the lawgiver. Uh, Judah became the line of kings, and as we looked at already, the prophecy given to David about his son, which actually referred to Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ was the king of Israel under the, the tribe of Judah according to the lineage of Judah. Now, there's also Joseph. And what Jacob said about Joseph, he said, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him, but his bow abode in strength. And the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, even by the God of thy father, who shall help thee, and by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with the blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies under, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be upon the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Now see how deep this is, this and the one about Judah. Um, that's why before we get into that too much, we have to study a bit about who Ephraim turned out to be, who, who Manasseh turned out to be, and who Judah turned out to be. Now, uh, well, Moses, uh, he did very similar prophecies about all the 12 tribes in Deuteronomy chapter 33. And I'll just go through Judah and Joseph from Moses. Moses was very short when it came to Judah. In verse 7, he says, And this is the blessing of Judah. And he said, Hear Yahweh, the voice of Judah, and bring him unto his people. Let his hands be sufficient for him, and be thou a help to him from his enemy. And of Joseph, he said, Blessed of Yahweh be his land for the precious things of heaven, for the dew, and for the deep that couches beneath, and for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun, and for the precious things put forth by the moon, and for the chief things of the ancient mountains, and for the precious things of the lasting hills, and for the precious things of the earth and the fullness thereof, and for the good will of him that dwelt in the bush, let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph, and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, 
and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. So, as you can see, the, the, the blessing of Judah is very much tied to Jesus Christ and to the kingship over Israel. And um, the blessings of Joseph are very much tied to the bounty of the earth. Great riches and great possessions all over the earth. There's just a basic look at it, the difference. But we're going to get into it a lot more before we get into that much. Okay, now let's take a look at Psalm 60. So this is when David was at war with Edom and Joab returned from a great battle with the Edomites. God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and mete out the valley of Succoth. Gilead is mine and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the strength of my head. Judah is my lawgiver. Moab is my wash pot. Over Edom I will cast my shoe. Philistia triumph thou because of me. So there's Ephraim. Ephraim is the strength of my head. This is God speaking, right? Uh, parts of this. Ephraim is the strength of my head, and Judah is my lawgiver. Asaph was a priest who David set aside as a musician to sing songs to Yahweh. In Psalm 77, verse 15, he says, Thou hast with thy arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. You see, so he's saying God's people, all of God's people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. The sons of Jacob are actually 10 tribes, and the sons of Joseph are Ephraim and Manasseh, Jacob and Joseph. Uh, Psalm 78 is also written by Asaph. Verse 7, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God, and refused to walk in his law, and forgot his works and his wonders that he had showed them. And then uh, jumping down in the same psalm, Psalm 78, jump down to verse 58. For they provoked him to anger with their high places, and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. When God heard this, he was wroth, and he greatly abhorred Israel, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed among men. And he delivered his strength into captivity, and his glory into the enemy's hand. He gave his people over also unto the sword, and was wroth with, with his inheritance. The fire consumed their young men, and their maidens were not given to marriage. Their priests fell by the sword, and their widows made no lamentation. Then the Lord awaked as one out of sleep, like a mighty man that shouts by reason of wine. And he smote his enemies in the hinder parts. He put them to a perpetual reproach. Moreover, he refused the tabernacle of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Judah and Mount Zion, which he loved. And he built his sanctuary like high places, like the earth, 
which he has established forever. He chose David, also his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. So this is interesting. He says that God rejected Ephraim and rejected Shiloh and chose Jerusalem and Mount Zion. Mount Zion is where Jerusalem is built upon Mount Zion. Now Psalm 80 verse 1 and 2 is also a psalm of Asaph. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leads Joseph like a flock, thou that dwells between the cherubims, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up thy strength and come and save us. Turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine and we shall be saved. So from the Psalms we get a picture of the view towards Ephraim from the time of David and Solomon. Especially in Psalm 78, where Asaph says that God rejected the tabernacle of Ephraim and chose the tabernacle of Jerusalem. Thanks for joining the Christian Perspective channel. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and turn on the notifications bell so you don't miss a thing.